And joining us now here in studio, Paul McFun, Operational Manager for MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières. And I guess, uh, as I welcome you here tonight, can you give us an update on what you've heard from your people down in Haiti? What's the latest as to how they're doing? Sure, Steve. Well, I mean, the situation, as you can imagine, is still horrific. Uh, reports back from our team is, is the situation is still very chaotic. Our teams continue to be overwhelmed by the number of patients we're seeing. Uh, we've managed, uh, fortunately, to expand our operations. We already had teams on the ground before the earthquake struck. We've struggled to recover our, ourselves internally, and now we're actually managing five uh, hospital uh, care centers, let's say. That's centers where we're trying to, to, to provide uh, first aid and emergency care. Now, uh, three of those are up and operating, so we're providing surgical care. We've seen, I think, between three and 4,000 patients. Um, at least 400 of those have, uh, we, we, we've provided uh, you know, critical surgical care to. Uh, we're seeing uh, 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 traumas, we're seeing open trauma wounds, we're seeing uh, crushed limbs, uh, we're seeing burns, we're seeing head traumas. So complicated cases, uh, a lot of those cases now uh, we're starting to see with septicemia, uh, so resulting in obviously amputation. So our teams are continue to be incredibly busy, we're trying to work 24 hours a day, uh, and we're facing, as you can imagine, many, many constraints to do that, none the least supply. Uh, we, we now have... Uh, a sufficient uh, basis of operation, at least in the, in the first phase, let's say. We have managed to get about um, altogether 165 international staff into Haiti to support the, uh, the ongoing effort. Um, and we're really constrained now to keep them supplied with the essential medicines uh, uh, and supplies and materials that they need to, to do their job. Paul, I've seen horrific video today. I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen it online. The supplies are so um, scarce that we are seeing doctors in Médecins Sans Frontières having to do amputations because of crushed limbs with no anesthetic. How, how, I mean, how do you do that? Well, I, I can't speak to our own doctors actually amputating limbs with no anesthetic. I doubt that very much. I mean, we, we, we have anyway uh, in country uh, 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 a stock specially prepared for us to be able to manage at least in the first stages of emergencies such as these. Um, having said that, yeah, you're absolutely right. We're working in completely inadequate conditions. Uh, we're really struggling with the supply issue ourselves. Um, you could say that we are at least two days late uh, in our being able to set up uh, uh, our own operations to a certain level and standard of care that we would consider the minimal under the circumstances. Uh, so we acknowledge that we're behind uh, many frustrations within our teams because of that. Uh, and increasingly, I mean, our focus is, uh, has been so far in, in Port-au-Prince. It's only recently, yesterday and today, that we've been able to get teams outside of Port-au-Prince uh, and start to look at some of the other areas, particularly in the south, southwest. And again, 80% destroyed situation, horrific, very few other actors on the ground. Uh, so, uh, yeah, our focus is still, let's say, a, a minimal drop in the ocean compared to need. So do I presume that if the hospitals have been destroyed, the essential in infrastructure is destroyed, you are providing medical care in the open air, outdoors? Well, we've identified some structures that were, were not too badly damaged or, or, or not damaged at all. Some of those are former hospital structures that have just been abandoned. Um, uh, staff that were there are, are busy either looking for their families or, 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 or they were outside of the hospital structures at the time. So we've taken over some hospital structures um, and we're working on pretty much independently outside of those. However, last night, for example, we had tremors in the middle of the night. Uh, our teams, after shocks, our teams had to pull everybody out of the hospital. We set up uh, what we call trigono tents. Uh, we're working under trees uh, with lighting. Uh, we're working out of tents. Uh, we're working out of uh, shipping containers. Uh, all these things we're turning into temporary emergency uh, surgical uh, units. So we're doing everything we can to make sure that that, that, that critical life-saving emergency care we're managing even under the most basic conditions. Not surprisingly, the people are getting frustrated. They're getting tired. They're getting angry. It's, it must be just insane trying to... Um, trying to get care, trying to, when you don't know when your next meal is coming from, etc. Things are occasionally turning violent. Are you hearing reports about how aid is getting distributed or not as a result of this violence? Yeah, I mean, across where we're working, we've seen very uh, sporadic delivery of aid. I mean, there's a, a lot of centers, if you like, uh, of uh, um, displaced now, so people are occupying open parks, etc., etc. What we've witnessed has been fairly ad hoc up until now. Um, and I imagine that that, that, that machine of delivering and, and, and basic non-food items and food and water is, is gradually improving. Uh, but yeah, there's been a lot of reports of, uh, of disturbances, violent events. We were at the airport, there was gunshots. Uh, it, it's certainly security is a concern. It's a big risk and it's, it's a factor that we also have to take into consideration. Um, and like I say, we still see a very slow response considering we're now on day six 
in terms of just basic delivery of humanitarian assistance over Slow and above response medical from care. Whom? Well, I think the whole uh, the whole mechanism for responding to a disaster such as this, you know, suffered internally massively during the earthquake. And the classic scenario of a, of an emergency in any given country is it it usually happens outside of the capital of that country. If you look at Pakistan, for example. Um, in this case, I mean, the, the agencies and the lead agencies responsible to bring that coordination, be effective, efficient, uh, I mean, they were also directly impacted. So it's understandable that there's constraints. It's understandable that it's, it's harder to get that level of coordination, communication, uh, and effective response up and running. Um, but really, the situation right now is we're burying our heads in the patients we see coming to our doors. We're trying to do our best to get our teams out of the hospital settings that we're working in to evaluate beyond there. Uh, but we're not seeing a huge amount of coordination, uh, at, at least that we could participate in, that's effective yet. Okay, because one of the things that I think most people have heard is that the world has responded so overwhelmingly, so magnificently. So many citizens have given money and so on. Uh, but are you saying that the effort right now is so poorly, if, if the effort is so poorly coordinated right now, what's one thing they could be doing to improve things if it's as chaotic as you say it is? Yeah, well, it's a challenge, and it's a challenge under these circumstances. That's very clear. A lot of operations pulled out of Haiti because they had no infrastructure left. They relocated to Dominican Republic or other places. Uh, the, the UN, the usual leading agency, and it suffered such a loss of staff, uh, it's hardly surprising. So it's had to be reinforced with another layer coming in from outside. Now, the coordination mechanisms are there, but for them to be effective in terms of dividing roles and responsibilities, simply information sharing across such a number of organizations, mm -hmm. It's difficult under, 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 let's say, between commas, normal circumstances. That will continue to take some time. But there are lead agencies that were there before that, that can be effective. Uh, and there needs to be priority given to those agencies that are already on the ground, already set up, that can be effective with the teams and, uh, and infrastructure that they That's have. you guys. We are an example of that. And for us to wait for two days to be able to get medical supplies into Port-au-Prince, because they get turned away at the airport and, uh, and end up in Dominican Republic. I mean, that uh, is unacceptable. Well, one of the criticisms we have heard is that the, uh, I want to be sure I say this properly, the Americans think they're running the show and they're in control of a lot of the endpoints uh, of the country. Are you hearing that and is that part of the problem? Well, I mean, I really can't point fingers at the Americans. I think it's been a challenge, it's been chaotic. Uh, the, just the airspace has been a big uh, uh, challenge. Who's actually controlling the airspace from one hour to the next? It seems to be somebody else managing the logistics of such a small airport with such a demand. I can understand that, um, but in terms of priority setting, of course, there's a priority for food, there's a priority for water, but there's also a priority for medical supply. And medical supply, we're still seeing a huge number of people where there's a, an immediate impact in terms of saving lives, uh, and somewhere along the line, planes that were cleared to land in Port-au-Prince, cleared at the highest levels through our contacts in the USA, end up getting diverted. Uh, in the post-evaluation of all this, perhaps there'll be some lessons learned. Um, but, but yes, I think preventable loss of life, uh, the, the numbers are going to be cons quite, quite high. Okay, take us through now your thought process. If you're a doctor on the scene, you're now almost a week into this thing. You've kind of tried to stabilize whoever's savable, right? Um, but the next problem is there's not enough equipment, there's not enough antibiotics. Septicemia is the next big curse, right, that can take people? Go Absolutely. us through that. How does that happen? Well, yeah, I mean, we're looking at six days where people have been suffering f uh, from, from crush wounds, open traumas. Uh, in a climate like Haiti, I mean, we're talking a warm climate. Um, we're, without the proper wound care, uh, yeah, the, the, the risk of infection is very high, and, uh, and, it, and it will take place very quickly. Now, at a certain point, that, that results in uh, clearly a loss of limb, and that has to be addressed. But once septicemia sets in, then a high risk of loss of life. Uh, so as a doctor, you're going to be facing tough questions, triage. I mean, that's what triage means. Uh, we're overwhelmed, I and mean, we have a lot of patients in a queue. We need to get the surgical care to them, but we need to have the supply to do it. Yes, uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll get that, and we'll get that soon. Uh, but it means triage. It means making choices about you know who has the best chance of survival. Where then do we put our resources and our efforts? And that, that's the tough call doctors and surgeons are making right now. If you don't get those resources, how long can a patient under these circumstances with septicemia survive? Uh, well, it depends case by case and, and very much on the, on, on the extent of the trauma that they've suffered. So it's a bit, a bit hard to just give global figures mm -hmm. to that kind of thing. But six days in, I can only reinforce we're seeing a lot of cases of infected wounds. Now that makes surgery an awful lot more complicated and chances of survival a lot lower. So when I talk about life-saving care and I talk about uh, the sense that our own operations in terms of life-saving emergency surgical care being postponed two days, yeah, that, that, that for us is, is very frustrating, very difficult for our medical staff. 
uh, a real challenge to, to, to manage. Uh, should Canada be doing something beyond what it's already doing? Well, I, I would say that the, the, the overwhelming support from your Canadian in the street has been phenomenal. I mean, we as a section based out of Canada uh, have had an overwhelming support in, uh, financially, and everybody wants to know what they can do. Dipping into their pockets is going to have a, a direct contribution. There's no doubt about that. And I'm not singing the praise of MSF. There are many good organizations out there. You can pick and choose. But I do think uh, it, it's quite resounding what, what, what is being done by the Canadian public. Canadian government, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not close enough to the coordination that's been taking place between government agencies in Canada and the rest of the international uh, mechanism, let's say. Uh, we, we, we struggle, as it is ourselves, to manage a coherent coordination with all our own operations on the ground. That's still our primary focus. We're there for the coordination mechanisms as soon as they become effective. Uh, but our priority at the moment is getting into areas where we see very few people on the ground and seeing what we can do to support. Understood. Paul McFun, it's good of you to come in and join us on TVO tonight. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure, Steve. Thanks.